Is it possible to understand the Quran as if it was revealed to us today? Why is it important to develop a fresh understanding of the Quran? Can we rely entirely on past interpretations to guide us today? How did people understand the Quran in the past? How should we understand it going forward? How should we remain connected to this book that we believe is the literal word of God? How do we teach our children to understand this book and remain connected with it? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Conversations. Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. I am your brother, Muqtadar Khan. May this month be spiritually fulfilling and elevating for all of us. As in the past, we will celebrate this month too with a series of conversations about the Holy Quran. This Ramadan, I want to ask the question, can we possibly have a contemporary understanding of the Quran? Understand and engage with the Quran as if it was revealed to us in the here and in the now. Only then can we apply it directly to the challenges we face as individuals and as an ummah. The reason why we need to have a contemporary understanding of the Quran is very simple. The Quran is a transcendent document. It's the word of God. It is addressing all people for all time. It's a universal message. But when we advance a particular interpretation of the Quran, a commentary of the Quran, an understanding of the, uh, of the text, then we have essentially uh, located it in, in a particular space and a particular time. We have given it a certain set of coordinates and that's where uh, the meaning of the Quran is now. It's meaningful for that place and that time. And when we understand the Quran again today in context of the second understanding, then we have already lost the transcendent meaning of the Quran. So therefore it is important in order to retain the transcendence of the Quran and perpetuate it uh, continuously across time and space that we continuously develop uh, a contemporary understanding of the Quran. I want to thank the Islamic Community Center of Lancaster for sponsoring this year's series of conversations about the Quran. I also want to thank Ikhra, a new think tank based in Washington DC that seeks to advance a contemporary understanding uh, of the Quran based on Dr. Safi's uh, new translation of the Quran. So I'm grateful to both of these institutions for supporting uh, conversations this year and I invite you also to support by essentially subscribing to the channel, liking the video and sharing it with your friends and colleagues and students and family members. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his holy book in the second chapter in verse 185 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this verse that Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide for humanity with clear proofs of guidance and the standard to distinguish between right and wrong and this is one reason why the Ramadan is not just about fasting, it is also about the Quran. It was in this month that much of the Quran was revealed. And it is in this month that Muslims all over the world turn towards the Quran. They read it, they recite it, they memorize it. I want to start an exploration with you, a dialogue with you, to try and see if we can develop an understanding of the Quran which is current. Reading the Quran as if God is speaking to us now and in our time and in our place. Yes, our understanding of the Quran will be different from that of the past, necessarily so. I also know that to many of you this will prove to be a radical and frightening idea. But let me assure you this is not a new idea. There are many, many scholars and intellectuals uh, and commentators of the Quran who have considered this in the past and recognized the importance of recognizing that the Quran is a transcendental document, not located geographically, not limited temporally. It is not located in one space and one time. It is a guidance for all of humanity for all time and therefore, by definition, transcendental. But in each era, in each time, 
it is important for us to understand what the Quran is teaching us and what it expects us to do. How can we become an ethical community? How can we distinguish between what is right and what is wrong based on our contemporary understanding of the Quran? And that is the conversation that I want to have with all of you today. But before we begin our discussion, I want to share two fundamental assumptions that I have about the Quran. The Quran as we possess it today in Arabic language, I believe is the literal word of God revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I reject some of the academics who approach the Quran as if it's a historical document. I reject the idea that it was penned by a human source. For that is number one. I assume that it is the literal word of God revealed in Arabic to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and through him to us. My second assumption is that it has indeed been preserved without distortion. Those are two fundamental assumptions, and I think if we depart from those two fundamental assumptions, then there will be no core in the religion of Islam. Let me share with you uh, how in the past, in a very simple model, how in the past Muslims have understood uh, the Quran. Here is a model of the traditional hermeneutics of the Quran. So there are several sources in the Quran and the way the Quran is interpreted. I uh, identify six of them here. Uh, the best commentary of the Quran or the best way to understand the Quran is to understand it from the Quran itself. So if you come across a concept in the Quran, you come across a, a guidance, uh, a ruling, uh, the way you try to understand if it's not uh, apparent at the straight up uh, from the verse itself what it means, then you look up the Quran and you may find that there are other verses in the Quran uh, that address uh, that particular verse. So when you read commentaries of the Quran, you will notice that they are constantly referring to other verses where the similar word or similar concept has been employed. And according to all scholars of the past, the best commentary of the Quran is the Quran itself. And then the second way to understand the Quran is from prophetic sayings, going to the Hadith uh, and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. How did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, understand the Quran? How did he teach it uh, to his companions and how did he practice it himself? Uh, that is considered as a second uh, form of commentary. The living of the Quran itself uh, is the second commentary on the Quran. And so we understand specific meanings of the verses of the Quran. Uh, from the way the Prophet understood and acted upon them. A and then there are, of course, uh, the linguistic straight-up approach, trying to understand the grammar and the meaning of the words. Uh, scholars tend to make the claim that Arabic is a very difficult language, very sophisticated. It has tons and tons of meaning for every little word, and so it's impossible to understand that. I, I don't know why they make uh, that claim, because there are millions of people who speak Arabic, uh, who read Arabic, uh, and no such distinction was made in the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He didn't tell uh, his companions that uh, you are not educated, you're not literate, uh, and so you don't know the subtleties of the language. No such comments were made. Uh, it is only today and in the past few hundred years that Muslims have dissuaded uh, uh, people from trying to understand the Quran directly in order to priv privilege the Brahminical classes of Islam, the scholars and the ulama whose profession it has become uh, to basically uh, do business in the meaning of the Quran, teaching the Quran and so on and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, it is very important. And the grammar is indeed sophisticated uh, and complicated uh, and the vocabulary, as in any language, is vast. Uh, so one way to understand is just purely linguistically. Uh, and uh, there are scholars who have used grammatical and linguistic approach uh, to explain the Quran. And then there is the, the approach of context, and this is very important. Uh, you look at a verse and don't just understand it literally and linguistically, but you also try to understand it based on the context in which it was revealed. Uh, why was it revealed and what was God at that moment addressing? Uh, it's called as Bab al-Nuzul, the circumstances or the context of revelation uh, and the reasons for, uh, for revelation and then they explain. Uh, and while we may not have the context for nearly all the verses of the Quran, 
Wahidi has about 900 plus in his uh, collection. There are others in classical commentaries. Uh, but that is one way to understand the Quran is by understanding its context. While it is very helpful, uh, you must understand and recognize that the moment you understand a verse based on the context of its revelation, uh, you have now eliminated the transcendental nature of that meaning of that verse. So now that verse is anchored in that space and that time. It has now become local rather than being transcendent. So while uh, the context of the verse is important, if every verse of the Quran is meaningful, universally valid for all times, then we cannot anchor it in one place and at one given time. Then there is also the approach uh, that uh, people may say is uh, from the Islamic intellectual heritage, the, the classical commentaries, the Sufi commentaries, the Salafi commentaries, the classical scholars like At-Tabari, uh, some of the more popular ones uh, uh, like today, thanks to uh, some of uh, the emergence of the schools of thought, Ibn Kathir is considered as a widely read commentary. Uh, in the world today. So that is also a source of understanding uh, the Quran. Uh, you may subscribe to a particular ideology and then you go to the ideologue from that group who has commented. So if you are part of the Ikhwan and Muslimin movement, you may go to Sayyid Qutb's Fizilal al-Quran uh, to understand the Quran. And so that is also one way of understanding. And I, I personally think that is the worst way to go because now you are not buying into the transcendental message of the God, uh, of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are now becoming a servant to the ideology of a particular movement or a particular scholar or a particular group, and you are surrendering your divine right to understand the Quran and act upon it, uh, and uh, becoming a slave to some particular ideologue. And finally, there is uh, the, the process of ishtihad, uh, and uh, an ishtihad is done at a given time where you're particular. There might be some circumstance uh, where people need to revisit the Quran anew. Uh, and so in that particular given in time, there might be new understandings of the Quran which are articulated. Uh, and, uh, and that is also another way to understand the Quran. Uh, I call the product of that ishtihad as context of understanding. So there might be some reason why you are revisiting the Quran. So for example, after 9-11, there was this question about whether Muslims in, from America can be soldiers in the American army, especially if America was invading uh, Muslim countries. And so many scholars uh, went to the Quran to to understand uh, what the ruling should be. And so it's part of the evolution and development of the Sharia. Uh, or the fiqh, essentially understanding of the Sharia, uh, and so a context-based understanding of uh, of the Quran is advanced. Uh, and uh, while it may be relevant to that time and place, uh, I don't think that it becomes uh, a standard by which, or rather, we freeze the understanding of the Quran for that time and place, and that becomes like a standard understanding of the Quran. Uh, and so when I'm talking about developing a contemporary understanding of the Quran, that is what I'm talking about. That in every given time and place, there should be an understanding of the Quran. So American Muslims living in the 21st century, what is our understanding of the Quran? It's quite possible we may have many understandings of the Quran, but do we have an understanding of the Quran that belongs to our place and to our time? That is the question that I want to explore in this conversation with you all. I hope that you are uh, becoming fully aware of this line of thinking. If you agree with me, please, uh, or if you disagree with me, or if you have other ideas, please comment in the section. Send me an email. Uh, maybe you can come on this show and we can continue the, the conversation. That is an important part of it for you to give feedback uh, in the, on the questions that I'm raising. So let's take an example of a verse from the Quran and try to see how a contemporary understanding of the verse can be different from past understanding of the verse without any changes in the linguistic uh, aspect of the text. So 
take a look at this verse. Azbillahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. La ikraha fi din qat tabayyan al-rushd min al-ghay. This is uh, the first part of the verse 256 from Surah Al-Baqarah, the one that comes after Ayat Al-Kursi. This is a very well-known verse, uh, often cited in debates and discussions when we are talking about blasphemy, we are talking of freedom of religion and freedom of thought and conscience. Uh, the verse uh, basically means, let there be no compulsion in religion, for the truth stands out clearly from falsehood. Uh, when I read this, I feel as if God is surprised that there is any need for use of force to compel people to believe because truth is so clearly apparent from what is false. La ikraha fi din rushd min al -ghay. Now, how do we understand this verse? If you just read the text of the verse, it clearly says that there is no compulsion in religion. You cannot use force to compel people to believe in a religion and act according to the teachings of that religion because the truth is so clearly apparent that it does not need use of force it does not need compulsion you don't have to go against the will of the people because the truth is so apparent uh, people will believe in that apparent truth and follow it that is what it means and it makes a lot of sense to me but when you go and read commentaries and try to understand this verse according to the methodology that I just described, you will find that this verse was, uh, the context in which it was revealed was because for some, uh, for various reasons that I do not want to go into it, uh, the children of some Muslims uh, grew up with Jewish families uh, and uh, even though the parents had converted to Islam or become Muslim, the children wanted to remain with the Jewish families and remain Jewish. There was also this case of one gentleman who, whose two sons uh, uh, converted to Christianity. Uh, and so there was discussion of bringing the children back and forcing them to become Muslims. Some apparently did that and others didn't and the Prophet forbid them from doing this. So this verse clearly comes uh, and addresses that particular circumstances saying that there is no compulsion uh, in religion if they want to remain Jewish, let them remain Jewish and those who have become Christians, let them remain Christians. But the scholars, once they started commenting on it, they seem to be motivated to limit the scope uh, of this verse. So they either said this applies only uh, to what we call people of the book, uh, Jews and Christians uh, and maybe Zoroastrians, uh, and that said, it does not apply to anybody else. And of course, it only applies to people who are non-Muslims, who cannot be forced to convert to Islam. But once you become a Muslim, of course, we can apply all kinds of compulsion on you so that you obey the Sharia and the rules and the norms uh, of the society. So basically, they try to expand the realm where compulsion becomes legitimate and reduce the arena where compulsion is forbidden. None of this is in the text of the Quran. None of this is in the text of the Quran where God says, okay, you can use force to force these people to convert, you can force, use force to do this, etc. None of that is applicable. Uh, and for, for us who are living uh, in multicultural societies, who are living in democracies, in secular and pluralistic democracies, this verse, if taken as a transcendent verse, which means it has meaning and ruling and application to all time at all places, regardless of what happened to those few families in Medina. But when you look at it like that, a contemporary understanding, then this verse is extremely powerful. When I first read this as a student of knowledge and not as just a believer trying to memorize a verse, it struck me as uh, very similar to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It essentially guarantees that the state shall not impose religious beliefs on anybody and religious practices on anybody. You cannot force people to convert and you cannot force people to follow any other practice, uh, either prevent people from practicing certain beliefs or force people to practice certain rituals. Uh, for Indian Muslims particularly today who are living in India and uh, are the targets of the rise of Hindu nationalism, every Indian Muslim scholar, every Indian Muslim organization today uh, wants India to be secular, democratic and pluralistic. 
they want it to be secular so that Hindu religious beliefs are not forced on Muslims, like for example, uh, or Muslims are forced to abandon the practice of their faith as the recent incident about the state of Karnataka forcing uh, Muslim uh, women and young girls from wearing hijab in public schools. So that is uh, the absence of secularism. So you know, Muslims want secularism there so that there is like Rahaf al-Din, there is no compulsion in religion, the state has no preference for any religion and does not force the values of that religion on someone else. So this is important. So this verse becomes transformative, powerful, meaningful. Uh, it, it, it galvanizes us. It tells us that God is with us uh, in our struggle against Islamophobia. So that is what I mean, that when we have a contemporary understanding of the Quran, it gives meaning to our life today. When we understand the reason why Islamophobia is bad, the reason why religious oppression is bad because God himself has said that there is no need for compulsion in religion and we all need to do is to make truth self-evident. So essentially it is a struggle uh, of ideas. Go out there and make your point and say this is, this is the truth and this is a valid point. And so that is an important part. So this is just one example as we go along uh, in this uh, month and talk more and more about the different ways of articulating a contemporary understanding, take different examples. Uh, we will probably be able to uh, pinpoint to certain methodological steps that might help us develop a contemporary understanding of the Quran. Uh, if you have any examples that you would like to discuss, please share with me, put them in your comments. Uh, and uh, if there's something that you find interesting, please share that too. Uh, and uh, once again, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. May your fasting, may your prayers, may your charity, may your sadaqah, may your reflection and deliberation on the Quran be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mine too. Uh, I once again uh, ask you to subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so, like the video and share it with your friends, colleagues, families and students. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and once again Ramadan Mubarak to all of you.